Leading the parade of men from HMNZS Harwaya into Trafalgar Square, Nelson, on the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar, is the band of the Royal Marines. A crowd of over 10,000 is out to watch the spectacle. Following the band comes a colour party of barefoot, pigtail signalmen, appropriately dressed in the rig of Nelson's Navy. A guard of 50 men, under the command of Lieutenant M.I. Harriman, R.N., completes the parade. At 12 noon, the white ensign is hoisted at the gap. The youngest member of the Howares crew, seaman boy P.R. Simonson, reads Lord Nelson's prayer before battle. Another tribute in a city with so many reminders of England's famous admiral is the hoisting of his historic signal, England expects that every man will do his duty. Next day is mainly for Nelson's children. But first, Captain C.H. Campbell, DSC and Bar, RN, second naval member, is piped aboard the Howares. Following the inspection, there are demonstrations of the Howares equipment. Where did that one go? Young Navy League members speak by radio to the motorboat in which others are having a trip. Another big thrill is the provision of refreshments for the youthful visitors, including the Iron Duke Sea Scout troop. Boy, if this is how they treat you, I'm going to join the Navy. Maybe so. But next time, there's going to be a polite notice saying visitors are requested not to drop ice cream into the secondary armaments. Highlight of the day, for the Sea Scouts at least, is a pulling race between their crew and the under-17s of the Howair. Strong pulling by the Scouts results in a clear-cut victory and presentation of the Derrick Shield by Mrs. Campbell. Finale to a great two-day show put on by a little ship, HMNZS Howair, in honor of the memory of Admiral Lord Nelson. The city of Christchurch in 1863, a confused straggle of buildings along the Avon. In those days of self-governing provinces, the Canterbury Provincial Council was centred here. Thanks to the efforts of men like Fitzgerald on the left and Rolleston, the press was able in 1865 to announce the opening of permanent council chambers. Here the council was housed till the death of provincial government in 1876. The completed building with its distinctive Gothic design became a Christchurch landmark. Today it's still a landmark, solidly centred in the life of a modern city. Students find shady trees for outdoor study in its grounds, and sometimes the surrounding stir memories of provincial forefathers. Visitors come too. In guided parties, they see the many points of interest, learn the story of the building. The story begins with its designer and builder, Benjamin Mountford. Architectural students, here to see some of his work, pause before the plaque by which New Zealand architects have remembered him. Last century, the time of Britain's forward march, saw a turning toward the past in architecture. Mountford came to New Zealand in the middle of the Gothic Revival, bringing 13th century architecture to a 19th century colony. The entrance doors, inlaid with native woods, are fine examples of the cabinet maker's art. And here's the central chamber. In these surroundings, men with a vision planned Canterbury's future. Through tall windows comes the light. The stained glass contains floral designs and texts. Sculpture also decorates the building, including stone masks. There's Queen Victoria. Her consort, Prince Albert, and the lady with the lamp, Florence Nightingale. Old craftsmanship for a new colony. And here's a self-portrait of the man responsible, stonemason William Brassington. His grandson, Mr. A.C. Brassington, a resident of the Christchurch of today, tells his wife and a friend some of his grandfather's story. An unusual feature in a Gothic building is the painted ceiling. It took two years to execute from the master plan of architect Mountford. Echoes once lingered here as the politicians of the infant province debated public works and clamoured for the Littleton Tunnel. Government departments now occupy parts of the building. Supervising care of the chambers is the Canterbury Provincial Buildings Board, 
composed of local members of Parliament and the Mayor of Christchurch. Year-round, the work of maintenance goes on, so that the building may remain for the casual seeker of interest, the students of the past, and for those people who find pleasure enough in an old world scene in a new world city. These rolling dunes at Murawai are just a sample of 30,000 odd acres where sand is creeping over the Kaipara Peninsula. Brought about mainly through deforestation by the early settlers, the advancing sands are now being arrested and planted by the New Zealand Forest Service. Designed by members of the staff at Woodhill Forestry Station, this machine has taken the sting out of planting marum grass. A driver and two men feeding the planter can do in comparative comfort as much as eight men with eight back aches could do by hand. The success of the small machine led to the design of a bigger and better one. This is hauled over the sandy waste by bulldozer. It carries a team of six men and can plant about 30 acres a day. Already 11,000 acres have been planted with marum and lupins. The machine opens a groove in the ground, the seedlings are fed in and the converging rear wheels tamp down the earth around the plant. After a few years, the sand hills are covered with a thick matted growth which is being planted with young pine trees at the rate of something like 5,000 seedlings a day. Completion of the project by the Forest Service will save a big acreage of rich farmland from invading sand and provide a stand of valuable timber for the future. Since 1939, this small rocky island close to Wellington's popular Scorching Bay has been the nesting ground for a colony of white-fronted terns. Each year, at about the beginning of July, a few terns or sea swallows begin to visit the rock, and by the end of September, the main group, about a hundred birds in all, has arrived at the summer home. For the past five summers, Bill Huggins has used school holidays to make a detailed study of the colony. Living nearby, he's a faithful custodian of the small seabirds, protecting them from stray animals and vandals on what may be the world's smallest bird sanctuary. Someone out fishing. Bill reports that the young male tern woos his lady fair in much the same way as his human counterpart, but takes along a small fish instead of a box of chocolates or bunch of flowers. Acceptance of the fish is usually a prelude to mating, but the young man's proposal gift is not always found acceptable. Go away, I've got other fish to try. Will she take the bait? That is the question. Neighbours take a friendly interest, and all is well when the young gallant is accepted with the customary formality. As the old proverb has it, one good turn deserves another. As turns don't build elaborate nests, the housing problem is slight, provided the section is secure. Until the eggs are laid, turns guard the rock by day only, returning each morning. They probably roost on one of the larger islands in Wellington Harbour. The nests are usually no more than a few pebbles, placed so as to keep the eggs from rolling into the sea or into someone else's nest. Hatching the eggs is a cooperative business. For part of each day, father does the housekeeping, such as it is, while mother goes fishing. Chicks appear in about 26 days. When first hatched, they're small and limp, but by the second day, they're fluffier and their black eyes are open. The down is a mottled mixture of black, tan and cream. Rate of growth is amazing, and in a few days they're wandering about, but not yet able to look after themselves. Time passes quickly. With the coming of the new year, the young and their parents begin to leave the summer home. By February, almost all the terns have left to find other haunts. Bill Huggins closes his sketchbook to await July and the return of the terns to their island rock near Wellington City.